Good morning. <laughs> it's good to have you with you. Have you here? I, I say it over. I've been enjoying so much uh, when we get together and get to see people in person. And uh, I'm just uh, having a blast. And uh, online, welcome. Good to have you with us. And uh, we're in the third part of a, a train of thought called Stand. There's times uh, last week we, we talked about, or week before, first one, sometimes you have to stand up uh, for something. Last week, uh, first week, stand out. Sometimes if you follow Jesus Christ, you just, it's, you're different. Stand out. Last week we talked about the fact that you, sometimes you have to stand up. Something's wrong. You have to confront or talk or address it and uh, stand out, uh, stand up is what you need to do. Today, we're going to look in standing strong. And uh, when things are difficult, sometimes you just have to stand. And uh, we've been following along the book of Daniel. And uh, uh, today, we're on chapter 6. If you uh, have that on your phone, or if you uh, have a, an actual <clears throat> paper Bible. Uh, and what we're looking at is... How is it that you can stand when the stakes are high? Standing when the stakes are high. Now, <clears throat> Daniel, the story we're looking at, is him in the lion's den. And one of the, how many of you guys uh, went to Sunday school and uh, heard of the story of Daniel? Okay? Yep, most of us? Okay. Just out of curiosity, how many in their Sunday school had a flannel graph board. A fl yeah? Flannel graph. Little fuzzy stuff. So they'd stick a little figurine of Daniel on the board and they'd stick a lion on the board and stuff, yeah. When we go to tell the story of Daniel, <clears throat> part of the problem is that we have the, the, the images from when we were kids, you know? <laughs> and there's a young Daniel and a bunch of kitty cats that don't look terribly fierce. But uh, the first week we picked it up, Daniel was about 13, 14, young kid. Now he's actually 80 years old, and we're with a different king. We're with Darius. And uh, that picture is not real because <laughs> he'd have been, it was, just, it, it was just a mud floor. He'd have been knee deep in stuff. And uh, it was, there would be no light down there either. So give me the next one. Uh, and uh, here, the problem with it is these lions don't look like a, a real lion. Give me the real lion there, uh, Joseph. The lions are just absolutely terrifying. And uh, throw me down in a pit of that stuff and... Uh, it's a different story altogether, and we lose some of the impact. I think there's a lot of the stories, Noah's Ark and stuff like that we learn. But today, when we look at Daniel, he's 80 years old. It was a real lion's den, and it, uh, not the kid-type kid version, but uh, a little bit of context here. He had moved from Nebuchadnezzar. This was actually the third king that he would serve in his 80 years, and uh, King Darius was a brilliant administrator. And uh, we're going to see that when he uh, was running the kingdom, he divided his kingdom up into 120 different provinces. He put a person in charge of each one. And then he put three people in charge of the 120. <laughs> and uh, so the 120 were to make sure that the taxes were collected, no uprisings, uh, to make sure that uh, there was a balanced budget. <clears throat> they used to do that. And uh, so they were really overseeing the whole running of each one had their own territory. And uh, the three people who were to oversee the 120, one of those persons was Daniel. And so they probably would be the most, three of the most powerful, influential people in the land. Now, King Darius, after he watched them run for a little while, then... And he got Daniel to see Daniel operate. Uh, uh, he was elevated to the top of the three. So you have 120, three, 
and one. And Daniel was uh, made, really, the uh, chief administrator of the whole country, probably uh, in power next only to uh, King Darius himself. Now, here is the scripture. At this, the administrators and the satrap tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in the conduct of his government affairs. <laughs> if he would, they went to, uh, it turned on him and uh, kind of went Hunger Games and we're going to take him down because they didn't, they didn't want anybody to have any authority over them. And so when Daniel was elevated, they tried to tear him apart. And in our life, oftentimes, when God puts us into a place where he's asking us to step up or to do something for him, or it could be something simple, like uh, quite a while ago we had a... a Years ago, we used to leave Wednesday nights free in the city so that you could send your kids to church and none of the sports operated on Wednesday night and Sunday morning. And then slowly they started to uh, operate on Sundays and Wednesdays. And now the parents had to make a decision. And some parents would decide that sports were interfering with church. And so they wouldn't go on the uh, travel leagues because they'd be away weekends. And uh, they decided that for the... Uh, spiritual and emotional physical health of their children, they would not go into certain uh, leagues. And that would cause pressure for some of the parents, especially if the child was uh, a good athlete. They would say, we need him on the team. But the parent would say, you know, I really, for his good, we're not going to do that. And, uh, or it could be anything like you decide to uh, become disciplined and get out of debt and control your, anything that God asks you to step up and do, people have a tendency uh, to tear you down. And so when Daniel was elevated, they went looking for reasons to block his move, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy, neither corrupt nor negligent. And so <laughs> as they begin to examine all of his books uh, all of his transactions, all of his governing decisions, they could not find anything they could show to the king to just say, look, you, you've got a loose cannon here. You can't be doing that. Uh, he had lived a life of integrity and apparently wisdom. And so his reputation was impeccable. He had moral authority, intellect, and he had the uh, blessings of God. And I would tell you this, many times we want promotion and all that kind of stuff. And we say it, promotion comes from God. You look at, uh, the easiest stories, of course, are uh, Joseph. He actually was uh, thrown into a dry well, put down, sold for slavery, 20 pieces of silver. That's a bit of foreshadowing there, but sold for 20 pieces of silver. And he was a slave in Egypt got into Potiphar's house, uh, wound up in jail, and uh, went from jail, was uh, released into the uh, Pharaoh's house, and he became number one in the land, next only to the Pharaoh himself. These are, it doesn't matter where God elevates you from. It doesn't matter where you are. God will put you if you have the character, you have the integrity, and you have the, the connection to God where he can use you in his kingdom, he will take you from wherever you are to where you need to be. And so promotion <laughs> comes from God. And here is Daniel, taken as a slave down there in his uh, probably early teens or so, educated, and uh, supposed to become influential in the land. But again, God chose to elevate his position until at this time in his 80s, he probably was the most influential uh, man, person in the kingdom. Finally, the men said, we're never going to find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with his God. So <laughs> they were trying to take him down. They couldn't find any legitimate reason, so they had to cook up something so that they could have an accusation against him that would take him out of the running and then they could figure out among themselves who was going to run the country. So you have to expect that when God lifts you up or asks you to step up, you can't be surprised 
when opposition comes and people would try to tear you down. Now, <clears throat> it could be anything that God has asked you to step up to do, but the people who you think should be the most excited and the most positive sometimes are the most critical. And sometimes you're hampered and attacked and pushed back by good-meaning people, but they just uh, become uh, the face and the pressure of opposition. And so here, the three men that he would, the two men that he was leading with, try to take him down, and it's such a life of integrity that they had to concoct something. So what are they going to do to bring this guy down and uh, to make sure that he doesn't become the number one man in the land? Well, they went to King Darius. They butter him up. I don't know how you butter up a king, but uh, I don't even know if they had butter. But, uh, <laughs> oh, King Darius, great man, greatest king over all kings. Wonderful. Uh, Hey, you're filling that row, buddy. You're working out there. You're looking good, man. And uh, so I don't know how you butter up a king. But anyways, he took the flattery. And they said, listen, you're the king of all kings. Here's what we're going to do. We should set up a way uh, just to acknowledge your greatness and your majesty and your divinity. Let's say that nobody can worship anybody, anything, anywhere but you for 30 days till the whole world knows you are the man, you are the king. And so they set it up where nobody was to worship anybody but Darius for 30 days. Now, <laughs> obvious, they knew Daniel's practice was to pray to God, and he would go in front of the window that faced back to Jerusalem. He'd open the <laughs> window, and he would pray three times a day. His, uh, that was the habits of his life. And he said, those guys knew very well. We can pass a law, but Daniel's going to stay in connection with his God. And so I think Daniel had some choices here. And think about it with me. If he goes to that window and prays again, the whole thing is to get him killed. It's pretty obvious what they're doing. He knows. If he kneels there, he's going to get killed. And uh, he can say, you know, God, we've been talking for 80 years <clears throat> Uh, let's take a 30-day break. I'll pick you up at the end of the month. And uh, this thing's going to, they're going to kill me. So you understand. He didn't do that. I think another thing he could have done was he didn't have to pray by that open window. He just could have prayed silently. You know, he just kept it to himself and walked up and down the palace halls and had a conversation going with God so that nobody could see that he was actually praying to somebody other than King Darius. And... Uh, you praying, Daniel? No, no. Just thinking kingdom stuff, doing some planning in the municipality here. But he didn't choose to do that. He took the third choice. He went, and it says, as he had always done. It was his habit. It was his practice. He went to the window, and he knelt down, and he prayed. And he would not be taken from his God time. And uh, I think that there's many lessons in here. And one of them is, how close would you have to be to God to not worry about putting yourself in a life-threatening situation and just do it anyways? And it was so important to have that relationship to God that he wouldn't change his habit of meeting with God. And... The second point is that because of his habit of kneeling to pray, he could stand against the pressure and the opposition of man. Because he knelt before God, he was able to stand against the pressure of mankind. And it says three times a day he would kneel and pray and give thanks and worship God. And I would say... If there's ever a group of people who need to be thankful, it's us. I mean, really, life is pretty good for us. And uh, a lot of our problems we worry about are first world problems. What was it Mark Twain was supposed to have said? I worried about a lot of things. Some of them actually came true. We should be praying rather than worrying, and we should be in a constant relationship 
to God. A lot of the things that Daniel did came because the decision was made before he got to the crisis. He had already decided three times a day he was going to pray. That wasn't something he had to figure out. And when he said you can't pray, the decision had already been made. And the same with the foods that had been offered to idols. When he was offered to sit at the he had already decided he was not going to do that. We have to have things in our life that we have decided this is how we're going to live. <laughs> I think one of the interesting things is it's easier for me to criticize you than it is to clean up my act. And as long as I can find things wrong with you, and for some of you it's easier than others, <laughs> you know, to judge, and st then, it, then, then I don't have to deal with me because I'm judging you. Are you tracking with me? It's just easier to judge other people than to make the decision, I will walk with God. And I find that it's a full-time job for me to keep my own life on the straight and narrow without taking responsibility for your life. And so each of us has to make decisions about the practices of our life. And if we don't have a plan, it says, as he always did, if we don't have a plan to know God, what is it? If you don't have a plan, that's a plan to fail. fail. If you don't have a plan to learn and to become intimate with God, you have planned to fail. Here's the problem with that is, when they were standing before God, and he was speaking to a bunch of scribes and Pharisees and stuff like that, guys who had a bunch of rules, and he said, here's the way it's going to go. He says, you guys, get out of here. I don't know you. I don't know who you are. We've never talked before. So the question is, Daniel has decided ahead of time that he would know God, he would know God's will, and he would spend time with God. Do we have enough time in the presence of God that he could say, he knows us, or we know him, or we understand his guidance for our life? Have we, spent, have we disciplined ourselves to have enough time walking with God privately and for me, it's, uh, I don't do it in the morning. He asked me not to because I'm grumpy. So I had to do it later in the day. <laughs> but basically, and then I write in the, you know, stuff. But the Spirit wrote it, and you have to be spending time. It has to be in your, if there ever I run into trouble, it's because I'm not following my appointments, my day timer, my time. You're with me? And so if you don't, number one, plan it, and if you don't work your plan, you're never going to get to know God. Here, you sit down. This was written and inspired by the Spirit. So we take a time, and we read the Spirit-inspired Word, and the Spirit, we invite him in to teach us what's in the Word. And that is how you get to know God. God will teach you. Jesus says, when I'm going away, the Spirit will teach you all things. Just relax and spend time learning about God. Now, if you don't have this scheduled in, it ain't happening and you're not getting to learn to God. So what's the thing to do? Get mad at me because I'm pointing out you don't have a, uh, a hope? No. An alternative would be to not spill water, but another alternative would be to take it as seriously as Jesus did so that we would never hear, I don't know you. We've never talked. You need to go and be separated from those who are my family, my relationship, and my children. I think it's so interesting. Uh, she sat right over there in the second row, but I can't think what I here spread my germs. But anyways, it was interesting to watch her die. She was going home to be in the presence of a God who she knew so very well. So she has her family all around her. Ginny, by the way, that's who I'm talking about. She brought her family in all around her. They came from all over the United States. And, and she's just talking away, and she's talking about God and, uh, and uh, bringing each of them uh, an awareness of her closeness with God. And uh, this was not a trip to a strange land for her. It was unnerving 
how peaceful she was. She was just going to be with Jesus. She talked to him every day. She knew the guy by the first name. They were friends. And she was so relaxed. I'm telling you, it was unnerving how relaxing it was for her to let her body go and free her spirit. Jesus said, it's important that I know you. It's on that basis that we have a relationship on the other side. Now, there's things we have to do. He said, did you feed and all that kind of stuff? And if you know Jesus Christ and you know the heart of Jesus Christ, those are the things you will do. But they come from a heart that knows God. And you have to be in the presence of God <laughs> to have your brain transformed into the way God thinks. Now, those of you who grew up in Sunday school and never took on a walk on the wild side, whatever, but for people who have had to uh, correct their life and their thinking, you have to have your mind washed, rewired, taught how to rethink, taught how to understand the creation and God, and you have to spend huge amounts of time letting God rewire your brain. Don't be conformed into the mold of this world, but be transformed. Have your, I love it, I translate it. But let God rewire your brain. Your brain has pathways in it that flat out aren't good. You have thought patterns which aren't healthy. You have ways that you think which are counterproductive. And God is saying, don't be pushed into that mold. Let me rewire your brain. And I know some of you, you need it rewired. So you need to let God have access so that we can think things like he does. And he says, then you'll know God's perfect will. Then you will know what he wants for you. Then you'll know how to walk with him. So Daniel walked with God. And that prayer he spent on his knees was so powerful that we need to respect the time we spend in prayer and with God. Sometimes people say, oh, all I can do now is pray. <laughs> God's going, boy, if you just left it up to me, we're in trouble here, man. If you've done all you can do and, and you can't think of anything else to do, <laughs> I don't know. If you can't handle it, what am I supposed to do? God, God never says that. But uh, all I can do is pray. Listen, you have access to God. When Daniel prayed, the uh, representative, the angel that was sent to him, the, he said to Daniel when he finally got there, he said, I started the day you prayed. God, your father, heard you. He sent me to you day one. Yes, this is 21 days later, but you need to know God was not ignoring you. As he sent me, I got into a tussle. Two of the more powerful beings the, uh, the uh, power and the principality of the, of the spirit world of Persia. And so he got into uh, a war with the guy on his way to Daniel. And uh, so he's telling Daniel this, and he said, uh, God had to send Michael, the most powerful angel. And so here you have the prince of the power of Persia. You have Michael, the archangel, going to battle eye to eye toe-to-toe, -to -toe, belly button to belly button, they are doing it in the heavenly places, warfare. And when you pray, you, you, get, you can't get your eyes on the, on the flesh and the blood. You have to remember our spiritual battles take place in the heavenly places, in the powerful forces. And so right from day one, he starts, he got interfered with. Michael comes, sets him free, and he goes to answer Daniel's prayer. When you pray... You are in the presence of your heavenly father. You're talking to the guy who said, let there be light. <laughs> there was light. Let me separate the day from the night. <laughs> there was day and there was night. Let me take all this stuff and form it into a universe. There was a universe. He is the one who, <laughs> when uh, they were praying and they needed more time, he says, uh, listen uh, to the mathematicians over there running the clock of the, of the universe. Hold it up a little bit. Don't let the sun go down till we get this battle won. He is the one who changes time. He is the one 
who from one man and one woman put every person on the face of the earth. And he is the one who at the end of time is going to call an end of time and come splitting through the skies and take his family to be with him. When you pray, you are in the presence of the most powerful spiritual force in the universe. And when Daniel began to pray, the prayer answer was on its way immediately. So sometimes as you pray, you may not get the answer immediately, but you need to know that you are in the presence of a holy God who loves you, who is your father, who delights in doing and helping and protecting you. You don't say, oh, all I can do is pray. You say, I can pray to my father who can change the events of the world. That is your heavenly father. That is where you go to pray. It's not, oh, I've done everything I can do. Now I only pray. No, no. God is a powerful heavenly father. You need to be spending time with him until he rewires your brain to be like Jesus, who is the fullness of God the Father. You need to be and have the spiritual DNA of your father. You need to understand from his word, what's going on around us. So we see all of this turmoil. What does it mean? The followers of Jesus Christ, what does it mean? It means time's getting close. Relax. You're soon about to go to a really neat place. Relax. God's in charge. It doesn't matter who's president. It doesn't matter who's vice president. It doesn't matter. God only allows what he will allow. He is in charge. He didn't suddenly lose control of the world. He's got the whole world in his hands. He didn't lose control. It's okay. Don't sweat it. Pray, talk, understand the mind of God. Don't get afraid. We are children of God and we have access to the most powerful force in the world. So we need to have decided ahead of time that we would get to know God. And then we need to have the time planned and we need to do it. Third thing that happens that can happen when you do what's right or when you're promoted is you have to trust God for the outcome. <clears throat> Sometimes, most of the time when we're really stressed, if you think about it, what you're stressed about is you want this result. You're not processing you're not doing the faithfulness. You are attacking what you want for an outcome. You with me? I want this outcome. God requires that we walk faithfully with him. He looks after the outcome. So you're with Joseph stuck in a jail, up to your armpits and mud and slush. All you have to do is be faithful in your knowing God and spending time. And he is the one who will elevate you. You don't suck up to the boss. You don't do all the rest of the stuff. You're faithful in your walk with God, and you do your best with integrity, and God looks after results. When you get stressed, it's because you've gone to outcomes rather than walking faithfully with God. Are you tracking with me? You'll hear the difference. And so, uh, no, I won't go there. Behave. Okay, I will. Thank you. <coughs> all right. So, <laughs> Daniel had a life of process, a life of walking with God, and he trusted God for the results. Now, he had no assurance that when he opened the window to face Jerusalem and prayed that he wasn't going to become lion niblets. He only knew that his life process was to pray. He was going to do what he needed to do in his life, and God would look after the results. He didn't know for six centuries he would become a Sunday school lesson. He only knew that he had to every day talk to God three times because he had decided that's what he was going to do. Now, interestingly enough, if the lions had ate him, it had been just the same. He'd have still said, God's been faithful to me. I will be faithful to him. We don't get involved in outcomes. We get involved in the process of living a life every day that pleases God. That's our responsibility. God's responsibility is the outcome. You are kind of playing God when you move from process 
living to grabbing hold of the outcomes. Are you with me? Our job is to walk faithfully with our Lord and to do his will. <coughs> so here, uh, he gets thrown in the lion's den. He didn't, it could have happened that way, the other way. He didn't really know. He didn't know that uh, he wasn't going to get eaten. And uh, <coughs> Darius is more than a little ticked off. Why? He liked Daniel. <coughs> Daniel became one of the more important advisors. And these two other guys had tricked him into killing the guy that he liked. And he was ticked, to say the least. And uh, it says he was so upset, he didn't eat. He didn't have any entertainment that night. He prayed for the safety of Daniel. He was just saying, how could I have been so stupid? And yet, how many have heard uh, the saying, no, you can't, and that's the law of the Medes and Persians, and it won't get changed? Got the, have you ever heard that law of the Medes and Persians? No, really. Here's the law of the Medes and Persians. Once the law is made, you can't change it. Even the guy who made the law can't. <clears throat> it says, so Media and Persia united a kingdom, and so once he agreed on a law and it was decreed, nothing could change it, including the person who made it. That's the law of the Medes and Persians. So I was raised with the law of the Medes and Persians. I heard that saying a few times. But anyways, that's the law, and he had made it, and he can't change it. He had decreed that if you don't worship me for 30 days, you die. And there was no way out of it, and so he freaked out. But the very first thing the next morning, he goes, Daniel, Daniel. Are you alive? And uh, so I'm not sure the king expected him to be alive, but he was sure hoping. And so Daniel yells up from the skunk pit of lion poop, and he says, God sent his angel. He shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me. Because I was found innocent in God's sight. By the way, king, I have never done anything wrong before you either. And the king was overjoyed, and he gave orders for Daniel to be lifted out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted, there was not a wound found on him because he had trusted God. Again, if he'd have been eaten by the lions, he'd have just been in the presence of God who he'd talked to for 80 years. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you're in a no-lose scenario. You are in a no-lose scenario. So Daniel said, I'm just going to obey God and trust him with the outcome. And King Darius shouts down, he says, the God who you worshipped, did he save you? Daniel says, he sure did. Now, it didn't go so well with the other guys because the angel was tired from keeping the lions off Daniel all night long and they threw those guys down and sure enough they got eaten by the lions who wouldn't eat Daniel. So outcomes are God's. Living a life that's pleasing to God is our responsibility and now we are in a place where he can do stuff with us. So number one, if you're facing opposition because of obedience, you're going to face opposition. Uh, we were saying last week, uh, I get emails literally from all over the country telling me what I should be doing. And I was saying, you can get a church going in 60 different directions at once if you don't know where you're going. And you have to know what the right thing is to do and do it, and the consequences are with God. The outcomes are always with God. But we just have to do what is right. And so when God asks you to step up, sometimes and most often you will find a level of opposition and you don't worry about the opposition because in our Western version of Christianity, sometimes we think if I'm serving God, the wind should be at my back, the sun should be gently shining, I should be sailing along in smooth water, Life is good, grass is green, and everything is rosy and peachy. If you're serving God, you are in a spiritual warfare zone. And if God asks you to enter the fray, 
you need to expect opposition. I get more worried when things go too smoothly than I do when there is no difficulty. Does that make sense? If I'm not upsetting the king of the prince of the power of this air because I'm introducing an aggressive force of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, if he does not see me worthy of attack, then I need to up the charge. You need to know we are the aggressors. We are the invaders. The prince of the power of the air was doing fine until Jesus came and he says, I'm bringing a new kingdom. You are the aggressor in Satan's kingdom, bringing a new kingdom, the power of God. And if you aren't getting opposed, if you don't have difficulties in your spiritual life, you need to take it up a notch. Are you tracking with me? You need to understand. You can't serve Jesus Christ and not participate in the spiritual warfare that he has. The second thing is, when we kneel, it gives us the strength to stand. You need to talk to God in prayer. I have had to kneel. Sometimes the weight... It's hard to have a good conversation with God when your disposition's like this. And you're telling God what he's got to do. I have it on good authority. He usually doesn't. <laughs> When I pray, I tend to go like this. I'm open. <clears throat> Speak to me. Guide me. Tell me. I'm, whatever you want, I'll do. Just uh, lead me. And a couple times, the, the pressure gets so great, you just have to fall before God on your face. And uh, God will talk to you. Sometimes it's not what you want to hear. I was talking, I've been praying for a guy for, I was going to say months, but it had been a couple years. He was a person that introduced me to Jesus Christ, and he took a walk on the wild side, uh, destructive. And I had been praying, and when I prayed for him, I knelt by my bed. And I would pray in that position. I was praying there one day, and the Lord said, stop, stand up, that's it. You, will, you need to know, first of all, this is a spiritual warfare. And sometimes people cross a line. But that's between them and God. There's one, there are three places where it talks about uh, the living damned. In other words, they've crossed a line, they're alive, but their judgment has been pronounced. Are you tracking with me? And there's nothing you can do about that but until he told me to stop, I was praying day after day, week after week, year after year, until he said, I've done everything I can do. The spirit has come, and I can't do anything. You need to expect to hear clearly details of life from God. And then you need to do what he tells you. Uh, some of the things I'm not pleased about, but results are his, mine is obedience. Whatever you're praying about, God is listening. Do you even have anything that you feel passionate enough about to be praying about? Are you in a conversation with God? Quietly, where if he did say something, you could hear him. Our life should be like Daniel's, where every day we're in a place where God can talk to us. Sometimes you'll like what he says, and sometimes you won't, but he will talk. He will lead. He will guide. He is active in your life. So we need to go on process. We need to be before God in prayer and before God listening and meditating. And we are close to God enough so that what people matter, what people think, it doesn't matter. It's interesting as a pastor, um, um, you won't believe this, but not everybody knows that I'm the sharpest knife in the door. And uh, uh, it, when I said that you can get 60 different directions in a church, every decision you make, there's 59 uh, dissenting opinions. And uh, people say, doesn't it bother you when you're all the time... Uh, uh, people disagree with every decision you make. And 
the only way to get around that would be not make a decision, and then they would be uh, against you because you didn't make a decision. If you're a leader, you're going to face opposition. Get over it. Quit whining about it. Walk with God. Do what he asks you to do and stay on course. That's just the rules of the game. Does it bother me when I face opposition? No. In fact, it bothers me if I don't. Then I got to go quietly and find out why is Satan not interested in me? And that's a valid question. You, like, life does go smooth for periods of time, but relax. There's stuff coming down the road with your name on it. And when it comes, it's fine. If it's not opposition, you need to ramp up your walk with God. Does that make sense? That, that if it's too passive, Satan's saying he's not worth, worth it. You don't, you don't want Satan to say that. So here we go. We've predetermined to walk with God. We're faced with opposition. And uh, each of us, my prayer has been for years that you and I together would be a formidable spiritual force that Satan feared. Remember, we are the aggressors. <laughs> He'll lie his face off to you and put you on the defensive. You have the spirit of the living God in you. You have the spirit of Jesus Christ, and that is the image of your father. You need to have the spiritual DNA of God, your father, and walk the face of the earth with that confidence and never, ever be on the defensive. You are building God's kingdom in Satan's territory. Attack. Spread the word. Love in a world full of hate. Tell people to be more moderate. This last election, I was embarrassed at times. There's times you have to take a stand and say, guys, Christians don't talk like that. And you're tracking with me here? Uh, I think Christians are their worst enemies sometimes. Like, I'm looking at stuff and I say, I just don't see Jesus saying that. <laughs> what? We are to be uh, considerate, kind, rather gentle, and people should feel safe and loved when they're around us. Now, that doesn't mean you won't speak the truth, but it means if you ever have to speak the truth, if you ever have to stand up, if you ever have to stand out, they know that your heart is right with them and with God. My prayer is that we would be living that life as a community so powerfully that we are doing so much damage to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan, as we represent the kingdom of God, that he is irritated with our church. We got things coming uh, next week or a week after. You may be walking in a mess. Why? We're getting ready to invite the city. I mean, we got a church of people, so we need to continue the ministries to one another, continue the groups, continuing the lessons, continuing the fellowship and all that stuff. But the other part of it is we have to talk to the whole city. And so we're adding a department to the church, which will be talking through the internet. So we got this church and that church. And so we are needing, these are exciting times to be a Christian. I, I tell you, we have access to, the, to people like we've never had before. And so this is a once in a century opportunity to be the church of Jesus Christ. This is the greatest time to be a Christian. It's the greatest time to take a stand and to represent God. But it's also the greatest time to take opportunity of everything that's available to us. And so I'm having kind of fun figuring out how do we get the message of Jesus Christ, first of all, get us to continue to become like Jesus Christ, but also how do we invite others to experience the forgiveness of the presence and the power of God? So we're starting the construction, and uh, we'll be inviting people who are within body distance of the church <laughs> to bring their kids and that kind of stuff. We're making it uh, more kid-friendly. And then we're adding, uh, literally, uh, a worldwide ministry through the Internet. You can't stop it. It just goes around the world. And uh, uh, 
I won't get into that yet, but things are going to happen, so you need to be praying, and uh, if this goes too smoothly, I'll be worried, so <clears throat> I need some trouble so that I can confirm this is the will of God. Now, we've already had a year of battle after battle after battle. Uh, you, you don't need to know what's going on and uh, how intense it's been, but we're here. But now, I hope this intimidates Satan so much that there's a battle. You with me? If we are, if we are, str- if we are attacking in such a way that he feels threatened, then we need to get his attention. I'm cool with that. So let's keep praying. Going ahead. Our job is to be faithful. His job is the result. Will this reach a thousand people? We used to reach about a thousand people every Sunday morning. Uh, I'm not talking about people click throughs. That was 26, 28,000. I'm talking about people who too did. For various reasons, we're a small fraction of that now. But we need to turn that around now and speak to the people who we know already will listen to the gospel. Are you with me? But that comes by prayer. We have to pray that God draws them to himself through what we're doing. And so uh, my dad used to say, just keep on keeping on. So when the, when the stuff hits, just keep on keeping on. It's being on your knees that helps you stand. It's expecting opposition and not being surprised. And uh, we are the church of Jesus Christ, which is the hope of the world. Would you stand with me? I don't know what God uh, is going to ask you to do, (coughs) but... I think... To have the privilege of serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is a neat thing. So in your prayer life, see if God's talking to you. What's he saying? What's he asking? What's he, where's he leading? And uh, then respond. So, and if you're online, uh, there's a, get in touch with us. Tell us what God's saying. And uh, uh, we need to form a community that's united in spirit and mission, so much so that it intimidates Satan. Remember, we are the ones who are challenging Satan, and he's hiding behind the gates of hell. We're not the ones hiding. Sometimes people would talk about, we're behind the gates of hell, and, and we're being attacked. No, idiot stick. You're the one attacking. Don't let Satan rewrite the scripture. We are the aggressors. We are the one planning the kingdom of God in Satan's territory. We are the ones standing outside the gates of hell with a squirt gun, firing at Satan and putting out the fire. So be strong. Stay connected to God. In the days ahead, good things are about to happen. Our Heavenly Father, we realize that it is so important to you that we rescue people from Satan's destructive hands and his uh, ability to lead them away from you. You've called us to lead people to you. So, Father, we listen closely, and we ask you to lead in the direction where you can work through us to reach those people who need to come into your kingdom. You've said it's you want everybody to come into the kingdom. You give us who you want us to reach, and Father, we will be faithful. We will not worry about the results, but we will conscientiously work in your vineyard, work in your kingdom, and to invite people to get to know you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, uh, that's it. I got a couple notes. Uh, Cindy, what do I got to say here? <laughs> Ways to give. By the way, thank you. The offerings have been maintaining fairly well. And people have been giving online in other ways. I just am so appreciative that we're able to keep the ministry going. And you notice the air conditioner is still on. The utilities didn't shut it off. Keep uh, your offerings to the Lord and your tithes. 
Wednesday night, this Wednesday night, there's a family night. And they found out this, there's going to be a fire, a pit. And there's going to be hot dogs. There's going to be s'mores. I'll try them out this week to make sure they're okay. You can trust me. They'll be okay. And so uh, is, you guys are on for hamburgs and hot dogs? Okay. Hamburgs, hot dogs, drinks, s'mores. And uh, so it's a family night. May even be a film. I don't know. Video. But uh, this Wednesday night, come on, at 6.30, that's it. Uh, again, I love being part of one body with you, and I'm having the time of my life. In the days ahead, we're getting ready to do stuff, be on your knees praying, because it doesn't happen in the flesh or in the mind. It has to be happening in a spiritual plane. So let's be all of us praying. Our Heavenly Father, change the world through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive this. May the power of the Holy Spirit fill you. May the Spirit transform you. May God's Spirit rewire your thinking until it is like Jesus Christ, who is like our Father. Amen.